welcome back to the channel. Um, I just woke up, so I might sound a little raspy, but I had to come and tell you guys what the Lord shared with me. So I was just doing my Bible study, and for some reason, I had made it over to Ezekiel, and I've not really studied much in Ezekiel, but for some reason, I was in Ezekiel, and... This is going to be a really quick video because I'm just sharing a message with you guys. I don't really have a confession. I'm working on preparing for my next confession video. I tried to record it already, but it wasn't right. It was kind of rushed and kind of one of those things where I was just recording it to try to get a video out. And the Lord was like, mm -mm. It's literally told me if we're going to do this, we're going to do it my way. His way, not my way. <laughs> we're not going to rush it. You're going to put the things out that I want you to put out and that's it. Like, So sometimes I do get caught up in like recording something just to like push, try to push a video out. And then the Lord is like, no, not that one. Like, Or he'll just be like, it's not time for that message. So I actually have recorded this video already, but it didn't work out. So... I'm going to be reading from Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 60. It says, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your older and younger sisters, for I will give them to you for daughters, but not because of my covenant with you. And in this part... So I'm in verse 62 now, but it kind of feels like it's repeating that same exact thing. So it says, and I will establish my covenant with you, then you shall know that I am the Lord. That you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your shame. When I provided you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. This is Ezekiel chapter 16, 63, 63. Okay, so pretty much when I was reading this, I was a little confused about the part where it says you'll be ashamed or um, I remember asking God, like, what does, what do you mean by that? Like, what do you mean you will be ashamed? Because that was my first time ever seeing that in the Bible where it was clearly stating that one, God is going to remember the covenant, but two, you're going to be ashamed. And I remember asking God, what does that mean? Why am I going to be ashamed? I just had so many questions, but I started just taking my notes. Here's my little notebook. I started just taking my notes as I've started to do during Bible study. And so I wrote down in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 60 through 63, God reminds you that his covenant stands. He said, sure, you'll look back and be ashamed, maybe even, maybe even embarrassed, but that's okay. Everything will be worth it in the end. So I was like, okay, I figured I got my answer. I was ready to move on into the next verse or whatever. But then I felt the Holy Spirit start moving through me as I, and I just began writing more notes. And I'll show you my notes at the end. It's really interesting because you'll, you'll be able to see when I show you my notes at the beginning and then you'll be able to tell the clear distinction of when the Holy Spirit begins to move through me and write this message. So this is what he says. God's covenant stands and the restoration will bring humility. So we will be restored. You will be restored and it will bring humility. The things you are going through, the pain you're feeling, it will all make sense in the end. When you realize that each part of your story has touched at least one person, it will all be worth it. So don't get stuck in the past or even in the right now. Sometimes things aren't going to make sense. So lean not on your own understanding. Put your trust in God and work your faith. Let God handle the rest. That is what the Holy Spirit says. So I remember when I finished writing that, I was like, wow. But honestly, at first, I wasn't even thinking like, oh, that was the Holy Spirit. That was God working through me just then to, to provide me with an answer to my question. At first, I thought that it was me writing the notes. I was like, wow, I, like, I ate that. But then I looked back at the notes, and I guess I'll just show y'all now. These were my notes up at the top. 
you can see my handwriting is kind of like just like note taking like you're not really caring about how perfect the lines look or the letters but then look at when the holy spirit starts to move how every letter is centered on the line not sitting on the line like mine were but they're kind of like in the center of the line and not only that but it's all capitalized see that clear distinction and i just thought that was so cool when i was writing it so then i was like oh wait that was the lord speaking that was the the lord moving through me to provide that message and so i read through it again god's covenant stands any promise that he's made to you any Anything that you feel like the Lord has pointed you towards, a dream that he's given you, a desire that he's given you. His covenant stands. He's not a man that he should lie. So there's no way that he could take it back. There's no way he can take it back or change his mind about it. The only way that this could happen is if we continue in disobedience. And in that case, it's not that he's he'll, he would take his promise away from you, but it would have to be passed down through the next generation. Just like we read in the uh, children of Israel when they were being so super disobedient in the wilderness. I didn't say, you know what, I changed my mind. You guys are about to be stuck here in the wilderness. You're never going to make it there. But what he did say was because of your disobedience, by the time you get there, all of you guys will be died off. Your generation will be the one to receive the promises. So that's what that made me think of. It's like your disobedience is not changing the way that God thinks about you. It's not changing his word. It's not to call him a liar. Your disobedience is only delaying the promise that God has for you. But his covenant stands regardless of how many generations it takes to get here. Like some of the things that I feel like I'm accomplishing, some of the things that I feel like God is doing through me or some of the promises that I feel like God is going to give to me or you know work through me I feel like those are things that I beat from generations ago like I feel like I am inheriting promises from generations ago sometimes I think I don't deserve this like why me like why'd you pick me but in reality it's just that it's my turn to inherit the prom the promises and so am I going to am I going to take them on full head and be obedient and, and follow the plan that God has for me or am I gonna continue to be disobedient and pass up on the promises and have to watch them through my kids and my kids' kids. So either way, God's covenant stands and like that's just what it is. The restoration will bring humility. So I, this was an interesting line to me because I've been hearing the word restoration and restored a lot lately. I've been hearing that <clears throat> a lot lately. And usually when I hear like a phrase or a, a repeated word, it's because God wants to tell me something. Like for a while I was hearing everything is not what it seems like I would hear that so often everything is not what it seems everything is not what it seems I would see it I would read about it in my bible and I was like okay God is telling me everything is not what it seems everything is not what it may seem to be like that was the message but when I had wrote these notes down I kept hearing restoration and uh restored you will be restored so it says there not only will you be restored not only will the things you've gone through um, be complete. Not only will the tears you've cried be dried up, but the restoration will bring humility. All the things that you've been through will bring humility. It'll humble you because you've been through these things. And I used to ask God, why is it that I go through certain things? Why is it that I have to um, deal with certain thorns in my flesh? But it's bringing me humility. It's humbling me in a way that it's humbling me in a way that I wouldn't be able to attest to had I not gone through those things. The third thing was the things you're going through, the pain you're feeling, it will all make sense in the end. When you realize that each part of your story has touched at least one person, it will all be worth it. I feel like this is a big thing in the community because when you get saved, you automatically feel or you might at first think that from now on life is going to be perfect. You're not going to go through things. But that is far from the truth. 
So once you realize and you look back on the things that you've been through, the things that you're dealing with, all of those things play a part in your testimony. All of those things are going to be able to touch at least one person if you are open to sharing that testimony. If you've struggled with one particular sin and someone comes up to you and they're like, man, I'm struggling so hard with this one thing. Because you've gone through that thing, because you've conquered that thing, you'll be able to reach out to them and say, hey, I used to go through that too. Not only are you relating to them, but you're also letting them know that they're not alone. You're also letting them know that there's ways to conquer that particular thing. There's ways to get through things like that. And without a testimony, we wouldn't be able to reach out to different people who have gone through the same things. So I have the perfect example for this. Yesterday I was at work and I had just happened to walk past two of my coworkers having a conversation. And one of them says, um, I quit smoking. So I automatically tune in when I hear that and I look over and I say, what'd you say? And then the, the third girl, she's like shocked about it. She's like, what? I could never. So because I had a similar testimony, I was able to defend her in that moment and to like kind of side with her. So I said, me too. I quit smoking too. And so the third girl again, she looks at me and she's like, what? I could never like, I feel like I would go crazy. So then the first girl, she says, yeah, I had to quit because it was becoming an addiction. And as soon as she said that, I knew that this was one of those God moments, one of those moments where God just arranges, he just arranges it to happen so that you will remember this. And it's for this reason so I could share it with you guys. So she says, yeah, I just felt like I had to quit because it was becoming an addiction. So I, I again, I'm like, so I'm like kind of freaking out a little bit and I'm agreeing with her. I'm like, yeah, like it got to the point where I would wake up and be thinking about it or I'd be so ready to leave work so I could, you know, indulge in those things. And she was agreeing with me. She was like, yeah, I would try to leave work early to get home to do X, Y, Z because smoking was becoming an addiction. And so just because I was able to relate to her in that instance, one, she, she felt heard, she felt seen. And she knew that she was not alone, too. She was validated in knowing that, yes, that that was an addiction because, look, this person has been going through that, too. But also this person was able to quit smoking just like you were. And it was just amazing to me because I've never heard anybody admit that smoking can be an addiction. I've never heard anybody admit that they were dealing with this. And I've definitely never heard anybody admit that they quit smoking because it was becoming an addiction. So. If you've watched my last video, I touched on this a little bit, but that's basically the confession that I'm working on. It's going to be about smoking. So whenever the Lord prompts me to send that video out or to start recording that video, I will. But right now, I'm kind of just detoxing from it. And I, I quit like two-ish weeks ago. So the craving's not there anymore. The desire's not there anymore. And I just thank God. I praise God for that. But... It is a real thing so just to hear that was so eye-opening and just heartwarming to know that I wasn't alone but also it let her know that she wasn't alone so like I said your story is gonna touch at least one person and then it will all be worth it so don't get stuck in the past don't get stuck in the sins that that you used to deal with and you're feeling bad for yourself and you're like God forgive me God forgive you he's forgiving you don't get stuck in the past but don't even get stuck in the right now God says don't even get stuck in the right now because the things that you're going through, they might not make sense right now. When I was stuck in the addiction, it didn't make sense in the right now. I'm like, God, why Like, why am I not done with this? Why, why am I not rid of this? I was leaning on my own understanding, thinking I wasn't strong enough when really it was, it was God's doing. It was God's doing. I was supposed to quit when I was supposed to quit. I'm, God said, sometimes things aren't going to make sense. So lean not on your own understanding. And don't get stuck in the past or the right now. It's not going to make sense until you get to where you're going, until those things start lining up, until you meet that one person who who says, also, I'm, a, I'm struggling with this addiction as well. And then it'll make sense because that's when it made sense for me when I'm like, oh, wait, other people are going through this. Other people are trying to beat this addiction as well. So God says, don't get stuck in the past or don't get stuck in the right now because some things are just not going to make sense. So lean not on your own understanding. And you know, 
you know you know that verse don't act like you don't know that verse so when i wrote that down i was like god you are good you really are your word that that was amazing he said so lean not on your own understanding put your trust in god and work your faith and let god handle the rest that's all put your trust in god Put your faith to work and let God handle the rest. Don't be so particular about your steps, trying to order your own steps or trying to uh, make sense of your own testimony. God says, put your trust in him, work your faith and let him handle the rest. The proof is in the pudding. This is me. This is the Lord. I don't know if you guys can see that or if it's going to be backwards, but I'm just going to leave it here for a second so you guys can screenshot it. And there's also a little verse there if y'all want to look it up. It's John 13, 7. Let me read it real quick. John 13, 7. So, um, thank you guys for watching. My camera's probably about to die, too. So, there's a lot going on. All right, John 13, 7. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know later. God says, What I am doing now you do not understand. But you will know later. You will know afterwards. You will know eventually. Don't get so caught up on trying to know everything of God. That's that's what God's here for. We don't. We're not supposed to know everything. We're not supposed to question His every move. We're just supposed to put our trust in Him and to keep continue to work our faith, and everything else will fall in line. I feel so great that I finally got this recorded. So, thank y'all for watching. I don't know if I should look over here, over there, but thank you guys for watching and subscribe if you haven't already leave some comments down below talk to me in the comments because i love responding to comments as some of you know because i talk to y'all all the time but comment down below if you have anything you want to say to me and if you subscribe you'll see me again let's just skip the awkward part and let's skip to being friends okay bye